Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, you know we're in a conference talking about uh, really about uh, prevention and behavior and wellness, and we're an electronic company. So what I'm going to try to tell you is, is why electronics matter, and you know how we fit into this equation, and you know how we can can help advance uh, this this concept of uh, of wellness because we're pretty far down in the ecosystem compared to a lot of the people in the room. Um, but we feel we're important enough that we did decide um, to help sponsor the conference because we think we can, we can help uh, play a role here. Um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe as a start, you know, if I look back on wellness and we talk about how it's done, been done the last 50 years, it kind of goes like this. This is how it's been done. And that's the outcome that we've gotten. And what I'm afraid of when I, when I listen to all the, the stuff and when I, when I think about what everybody's trying to do with the best intentions, what I'm worried about is that this is what we're trying to do, is that simply by substituting one device for another, that somehow that's magically going to change people's behavior. And I think, as I look at it, that this challenge of behavior change is the big problem. And I, I worry about this a lot because it affects my business and it probably affects your business. And I think it's one of the most difficult um, things that we have to face. So we want to do prevention, but we have this problem. We have the human being is in the loop. These unpredictable, difficult to understand people that we have to somehow um, get to change. And we, we've heard, um, you know, about the kind of time frames that are needed when we think about preventative health. We're talking about planning our lifestyle so that in the end we live longer and we're healthier. But we've already heard that humans are not very good at planning for the future. And all you got to do is look at the data out there to see people can't even save for a 401k. You can't do a 401k, you can't plan for your health going forward. And, and I think somebody said yesterday, humans are very bad, they, they discount the future when they think about their present actions. And so a lot, I believe, of, of getting behavior change is how do we make good habits and how do we break bad habits? And I can look at myself as someone, you know, I'm in this business like a lot of you, and look at the stuff that I don't do. I don't meditate. I know that I should be on a vegan diet, but I'm not on a vegan diet. I should probably sleep better. Um, I should probably have a few less glasses of wine, but I don't do any of that stuff, and I have all the data in the world. Now, I am fascinated, probably like a lot of people in the room, by science. And so I've gone and gotten my DNA sequenced, and I'm about to get my microbiome results back, and that's going to probably drive me to do something different. But that's me, and it's probably similar to the profile of a lot of people in the room, where we have a lot of engineering, scientists, technology type people. But how do we motivate the other people that don't have that motivation? How do we get them to change? And you know, it is, I was having a discussion the other day, and I said uh, yesterday at the conference here, and I said, Gee, how do we get to these people that are unmotivated? And I was corrected, rightfully so, to say it's not an issue that, that there's a large cohort of unmotivated people. It's that we simply haven't discovered what their motivation is. And so, and you know, maybe the, the second thing I've observed is I, I'm, I'm sort of a little worried that some of the stuff that we talk about is focused on the technological elite, the people that like technology. And when, I, when you look at the people that are affected, it's the disadvantaged. They're the people that are going to suffer the most um, from some of these health crises. And when I look at them, they're facing an enormous, um, enormously large problems that, that face them, or obstacles. One of the obstacles, you know, look at the U what we do here in the US, we have a very strong sugar lobby, a very strong corn lobby, who are putting basically poisons in our food, and the government promotes it. And then we have, um, in many places where the most disadvantaged live, food deserts, where all they can do is get fast food, they can't get fresh vegetables. And then we have, I guess because of competition in the restaurant business, huge portions. And what we do is, is people are faced with self-control problems, self-control challenges every day. And so it's an enormously um, hard problem. And so what I like about the conference and what we're doing today is that this is not a problem that any one company can solve, especially if you're going up against governments that are promoting sugar and corn syrup and things like that. 
This is a, these are, are problems that we can only solve working together, and there's no company in here that can do it alone. And that's why we're here, and I think we're trying to uh, collaborate as much as possible for the industry to, to help things uh, make things possible. One of the reasons that we collaborate with LifeQ is that we thought that uh, bringing electronics and collaborating with people who are pushing the state of the art in system, uh, in computational system biology, that something good must come out of that. And I, I think there were a couple of polls earlier, but I'm going to do one more. Um, are there any behavioral scientists in the room? One. And practicing physicians? One, and I think we asked before about insurance companies, payers or providers. Okay, so I know this is about consumer, and we're looking at consumer healthcare, but the fact is those people have to be part of the discussion. And I love the speakers that we had, and I hope that next year we can bring in those other things, because I think those are the, the, the range of uh, people that we need uh, to have a, a, uh, a great discussion and, and, and push the state of the art. So now let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Analog here and, and the problems that we're trying to solve. So um, over on the left-hand side, that's the business we've been in for 50 years is medical electronics. So the stuff that you find in the hospital. And, and to some extent, that's a, it's a well-understood business. It's nice. We can take those devices. We get to plug them into the wall. We get to hook up to the patient with wires. And, you know, all in all, it's a pretty simple problem. There are lots of regulations and things you have to do, but it's a pretty simple problem. And on the right is very much where things are going, which things that are port portable, they move with the patient, they run on batteries, they have radios, okay? But the people, you know, who are, who are going to adopt this stuff, they still care about that clinical accuracy that you can get from that device on the left. And it's a huge problem, then, to achieve clinical accuracy in a way that we've never had to do it before. And, you know, the first devices that hit the market, maybe they weren't the greatest or the most accurate, but they're getting better, and we're helping with that. And it's not just the electronics, it's the algorithms that people, like people in the room here, develop that make that happen. Um, what it does do is that, uh, you know, what electronics can help do is make this stuff small. So we're good at integration, we're good at making things very tiny. But probably maybe one of the most important things that we're going to do to help the industry is help enable long battery lives. And we'll talk a little bit more about batteries down the road. But, you know, essentially, I, I think one of the important things about any of the wearable devices that you've seen here today is that, um, you know, you don't really want to ever have to take devices off to recharge them. You don't want to have to have them stop working at a time when you have to take them off. Because what that does is that gets in the way of that habit-forming mechanism that's so important in getting people to, to make this part of their daily lives. So I'm going to go and um, show you some examples of some of the things we're doing and, um, and that might help uh, move the business, uh, this industry along. This is one thing we're doing here. We call this an algorithm development platform. When we go out and we work with uh, many startups and uh, companies working in this area, we find out that sometimes they create whole teams to develop hardware, but what their expertise is is really in algorithms and the medical science and the behavioral science or then how to build an app. And oftentimes, this is a friction um, in, in moving the, the uh, business forward. So this is a development platform that uh, does uh, ECG and PPG and, and uh, electrodermal skin response and temperature, all packaged up with a cloud interface where something that you can take as a development tool and you can use it to collect data, build algorithms, test stuff, do, do trials. It's not meant to be a commercial device. It's meant to be a development device. But it's a way uh, where we try to put all the expertise from that 50 years of measuring the human body uh, into a device um, you know, that, uh, that, that represents what we think is the state of the art. And one of the things you get with this is that uh, you get access to the integrated circuit technology at the same time that everybody else does. You know, you don't have to go out and get a wearable device on the market. You can get this um, uh, device now. So that's one, one thing that we're doing to help. Um, this is one of the things that we do is we spend a lot of time working on sensors. This is a new sensor that we're, we're going to be coming out with this year. It's called a spectrometer. It's a miniaturized spectrometer. So this is a device that was typically a lab, laboratory instrument. It would have cost more than $1,000. It would have been on a box about this big. Um, and what we've done is miniaturized it so that it could, if you wanted to, put it in a cell phone. 
Okay? Now, what could you do with something like this? Well, there's some simple things you can do. For example, you can point this at food items, and you can say, uh, that's a good apple, that's a bad apple, it's got this much sugar, um, my alcohol has, uh, is this, uh, my wine has this much alcohol in it. So we can do basic nutritional measurements with this. Uh, we can do things like look for counterfeit pills. So if you're in a, in a country where this is a, a safety issue, if you're in India or China, counterfeiting is a big problem. So this is a device that can, uh, can, uh, can detect whether your pill is um, uh, counterfeit or not. Uh, and there's a whole world of other biometric measurements that we believe that we, that we can do with this. It's possible that we'd be able to make body fat measurements or we'll be able to measure hydration with this. So it's really a new technology, frankly, that's a hammer looking for a solution, but it's the kind of uh, sensors that are out there that we're developing that are gonna be at consumer price points uh, that we're gonna be able to put into wearable technology. I wanted to talk a little bit about miniaturization just to show where we see the state of the art right now. So when I look at, uh, at wearable devices, I think that they should be invisible. Okay, now we're not to the point, and I don't think we'll be for a few years, to where consumer devices could be injectable or implantable. I don't think we're there yet. But um, today we can make these things uh, very small. So um, this is a, a thing where we took flex technology, high density flex technology, and we folded it up like an a piece of origami into a box. And so, and you can see the range of uh, vital signs monitoring measurements that we can already make with it. So this does uh, PPG and ECG and activity, and it's got a gesture interface because, you know, how do, how do you talk to one of these things? Buttons would be bigger uh, than, than this. And it's got a radio and an antenna. And um, so, so the technology's there today. This could be in a pill, but I think where, where it really wants to be is, is you know, wearables, you know, the, we have a lot of people who have made wearables for the wrist, and I think that's very valuable, valuable um, uh, real estate for people. People would like to have a watch or a fashion, um, something fashionable there. I, I think for health devices, maybe that's something that sits somewhere else in your body and it's there all the time and it's not something we particularly pay attention to. And maybe we don't engage with it every day. Maybe it engages us, maybe it leaves us alone. And when it's ready, it tells us there's something wrong, okay? The check engine light for the human being. And I would say the challenge we're having is that right now the electronics are much, much smaller than the batteries. So if I were to show you the size of a battery compared to the slide you're looking, it would fill, you know, your typical coin cell would fill the whole screen. So you've all heard about Moore's Law. And for Moore's Law and electronics, it's the things that are driving a lot of the work that we do. It's, it's driving a lot of the work that we've seen on genetics and the microbiome. Computing is an extremely important part of that, and it follows these, you know, double in capacity every 18 months or 24 months, depending on what business you're in. Batteries are the um, exception, and they have not followed Moore's Law, and there doesn't seem to be any sign that they are going to follow Moore's Law. So, um, and size is becoming uh, one of the biggest limitations that we see out there into miniaturizing these, uh, these wearable devices. So uh, as I wrap up here, I wanna leave you with just a couple of thoughts um, on habit forming. Uh, because as I, I go out there, this is the challenge I think we have in changing behavior. One is that if we're going to make wearable devices to be part of the solution, part of the solution to um, uh, wellness, uh, we should make it very hard for people not to use them. So they should be small, inobtrusive, we shouldn't have to charge them, they should be like it. I don't think we're there to the point where we're doing tattoos, but it should be like a tattoo. And, um, and then the other one is, as much as possible, we have to, dis to strive for some sort of emotional impact with that. Now, fear is one. Now, in our first slide, we saw the doctor trying to use fear as a uh, thing, and it doesn't always work. But sometimes fear does work as, as a way to motivate people. And if we can find measurements that sort of scare people straight into wellness, that's a good thing. But there's other, there's other ways we can look at it. But I think one way or the other, if you don't have that emotional impact, then it's very hard to change habits and it's very hard to get behavioral change. So with that, I'll uh, sign off here and look forward to working with you in the future. Hey, thank you very much, Jim. <clears throat> Let's do a question or two before we go to break, or by mentioning a break, does it mean we don't have a question or two? Thank you. I just seen the 
being the only behavioral scientist in the room, I guess I have to have a question. Um, what you're talking about is very much along the lines of what I found in my research for my dissertation. So um, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is how far away are we from flexible batteries? Uh, I, I think there, there's flexible battery technology out there now that's just starting. Hmm? Well, washable is a different thing. Uh, you know, we are doing a lot of work with the, uh, with the uh, clothing manufacturers and the people trying to do wearable electronics. And yeah, the wash cycle, I think, is one of the big, um, uh, the big imp impediments to, to seeing that go forward and the cost. Yeah, but there's a couple of companies. But uh, it's pretty early still. So. OK, we have one more, two more questions. Great. Uh, thank you oh, for, the, for the presentation um, and, and your sponsorship. I'm right over here in case you're wondering. Oh, there you are. Uh, my, que my question is around the, some of the platforms um, that you're creating around spectroscopy and um, the licensing models or the relationships that will make them accessible to uh, a broader set of innovators and mm -hmm. how you're thinking about um, implementing that. Yeah, so, so the model is, is that uh, we're, we're actually the hardware provider for that and we have a partner that has, um, you know, a, a sort of cloud-based algorithm um, uh, it basically uses machine learning of, of the signals to, uh, to figure it out. So with those uh, two, two things, there's essentially, a, you know, a, a buy the hardware and, and have a subscription for the software for that device. Hey, Jim, and, we have one more question, the last one from Victor. Sure. And how small is the spectrometer? And are you planning to have a, like a, a consumer device with that, or is it to integrate into somebody else's consumer device? Uh, yeah, it's, um, there, there is a handheld device out there today that's done by a company called Consumer Physics, and we, we, they're our partner in this, uh, in this business. The, the basic size of that one that I showed you, the, the actual guts of it are about 10 by 10 millimeter, and I think it's uh, maybe 5 millimeters high. And then we'll, we'll expect to miniaturize that over the next coming years, but the first uh, commercial device that we'll have out there for that. But it is meant to be embedded in other products. I, I think it's, it's meant to be, you know, depending on volumes and stuff, sort of less than $25 kind of a device. So we're not at the point where these are $1 uh, IC chips, but they're, they're not $1,000. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you.